thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Chris Contardo. I'm a neuropsychologist. I work here in St. Joe uh, at Psychiatric Specialties. Um, this is the most full I've ever seen this room, so thanks for, thanks for showing up. Um, this is a, a broad talk. We're going to talk about a lot of different things today. Hopefully we can get some good questions and uh, get everything answered for everybody. It's hard to get too specific into these things in, in this type of talk, um, but I'm going to try to go over some of the most common types of questions that I see and um, the most useful information that I think. Um, but you know, if you have a question or anything, let me know. We'll definitely have some time for questions after the, after the talk as well. So we're going to talk about a lot of different things, but we're going to sort of focus on these things. So what does aging look like? What does normal cognitive aging look like? And when we say cognitive, we mean everything that your brain does that you can't, that you can't see. So memory, learning things, uh, organizing yourself, uh, planning, making decisions, how fast can your brain do things. It's a broad topic. Uh, it's hard to define. Uh, but it, it's really everything that you do on a daily basis that allows you to function and make decisions. We're going to define dementia for you so you have a very good, clear understanding we're going to define the diseases that cause dementia as well. And talk a little bit about how important it is to find out things early and what the, what the process is for getting an evaluation or getting a diagnosis. And then also, what do different diseases look like as they progress? Talk about what ideally that process should look like. The, the process is different for a lot of people depending on um, where they go or what sort of provider they see. So. We'll talk about that, and then we'll do some recommendations for how do you uh, keep yourself healthy and in good shape as long as possible. So normal, quote unquote, normal cognitive aging is a uh, controversial topic. Um, a lot of people will tell you that there is no such thing as normal cognitive aging if you define normal as um, as everything staying the same. So the joke I like to make with everybody is it's all downhill after 20. We all start to slow down. It's normal. It's a part of, it's a part of life. It's a part of aging. Um, aging without slowing down or aging without difficulties is abnormal. Okay? So, um, and slowing down is different than having trouble doing things. But things slow down. So you can't pay attention as well. You can't multitask as well. The hearing isn't as good. Vision isn't as good. How fast you can make decisions and how fast you can find a name or find, that's, that's normal. That's how fast your brain can, how fast and efficiently can your brain do things. What's not normal is memory loss, okay? So memory loss isn't processing speed. Memory loss isn't how fast can you re remember somebody's name. There are plenty of people that age without losing memory or without losing the ability to remember something or learn new information. So that's the part that we're going to focus on. And it's the abnormal part is when it starts getting in the way, right? So there's a difference between doing something slower than it used to happen or being unable to do something, right? There's a difference with being bothered by not being able to come up with every word you want to come up with versus really not knowing what that name is or not being able to figure it out. A lot of people age and there aren't signs of those types of things, even though they're slower than they used to be and things aren't quite as fast as they were. Uh, th there's a difference here, right? So slow versus unable. Um, problems that start to interfere with daily life. Things that start to get in the way of, of what you really want to do. Some of the things that are very normal is forgetting a name, right? So these are some common, common reasons why people show up in front of me, right? Namnesia, right? Can't remember that person's name. You should know that person's name. You can't get it. It's on the tip of your tongue. It's right there. It comes to you a little bit later, right? When you, stop, when you stop worrying about it, normally you can remember it. That's normal, right? Walking into a room and forgetting why you walked into that room. It's completely normal. Okay? It happens to everybody. That's more of a distraction type of thing, right? That's not really, there's really no memory loss in that type of a thing. Forgetting where you parked in a very crowded parking lot. 
Very, very normal. Okay. So what, what, we, what we think about clinically and what we think about when we're making a diagnosis for these things is at what point are you getting to a level of impairment that's actually stopping you from doing something that you want to do? Does this have a pointer? No? Okay. Um, and that's really the goal of the diagnostic process is while things do tend to decline over time, when it starts to interfere with things that you want to do, that's when we start wanting to do an evaluation and start getting worried. So this is sort of how we break things up. We break things up into normal aging. We break things up then into what we call mild cognitive impairment. Mild cognitive impairment is when you do have some cognitive difficulties, but they don't stop you from doing anything, right? So there's 20% of healthy people as they age that don't have a dementing, de dementing disease, but they still can't, they can't remember things very well. But it's not really interfering with anything on a daily basis. So there's this whole subset of people that do start to have some trouble, and when we look at them on testing, they have difficulties, but it's really not impacting them in any meaningful way on a daily basis. And then as the curve continues, this is when we start getting into what we call dementia. So this is sort of a pet peeve of mine. But dementia itself is not a disease, right? So we all use the word dementia. We all say, I have dementia. Dementia itself is a label, okay? Dementia is a functional state. So you technically don't have dementia. You have dementia due to an illness, right? Or you, you can say you have a dementia. But if somebody tells you I have dementia, you should say why, right? What is affecting the health of your brain to the point where you're having difficulties in daily life. They're not interchangeable terms. Alzheimer's disease and dementia isn't interchangeable. Dementia is a, like, if you have a fever, it's because you have an infection, right? But the fever is not your illness. It's a, more of a syndrome. It's more of an outcome of the illness. So if you have dementia, that means you have functional difficulties. But that dementia is always caused by an underlying disease or illness or injury. These things can occur for a lot of different reasons. And we're going to get into the most common types of reasons why somebody can develop dementia or, or will eventually be diagnosed with dementia. And when we talk about IADLs, that means instrumental activities of daily living. So we'll I'll, talk, I'll use that term a lot, IADLs. IADLs are everything you're doing on a daily basis. It's cooking, cleaning, balancing a checkbook, remembering to take medications, driving, just general organizing yourself, remembering doctor's appointments, household activities. Those are all the things we do that sort of take up our time during the day. ADLs, or activities of daily living, are basic functions. So it's getting to the bathroom, dressing yourself, bathing yourself, and feeding yourself. So we do see impairments of ADLs at some, sometimes, but for the most part, we're really looking for impairments of IADLs. Those are really the first signs that you're starting to have trouble on a daily basis. So we really only talk about giving somebody a diagnosis of dementia when the cognitive difficulties that they're having is stopping them from doing something that they want to do on a daily basis or making something unsafe for them to do. And it's usually more than one thing, um, and, it, it, and it's usually pretty noticeable. So dementia is an umbrella term, okay? It can be caused by a, a lot of different things. The most common disease that we talk about is Alzheimer's disease, okay? But you can have Alzheimer's disease, and we can pick up on Alzheimer's disease before you meet criteria for dementia. Right? So it's possible to tell somebody that they have Alzheimer's disease, but they don't yet have trouble in their daily life. Okay? Deme uh, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form. Something called vascular dementia is, I think, more common clinically. Um, vascular dementia, we'll talk about too, um, really is related to more lifestyle type factors. So how healthy are you systemically? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you, are you a smoker? Those types of things. But the, really the important part of this slide is to really understand that dementia, dementia can refer to a lot of different things. Oh. Alzheimer's disease makes up the most of it, like vascular disease, something called frontotemporal dementia, 
Lewy body disease is also something that we see clinically uh, frequently. And these things can overlap, which again makes it sometimes complicated to give you a good diagnosis. So the, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease can be made clinically in, my, in the office, right? But it's really only confirmed when we can, you can only really confirm it with an autopsy study, right? You can only confirm it when we take the brain and look and see is there signs of that disease in the brain. And when you end up doing that, you can see signs of a lot of other things too. So that's really one of the big points to take home today is that dementia can be caused by a lot of different diseases. And part of the, the reason for talks like this and part of the reasons for a neuropsychologist and somebody that assesses memory and assesses functioning is to tell you exactly why you're having difficulties, right? Because these things all look different. They all have different symptoms. They all present in different ways. They all would might require different types of treatments and respond differently to different medications, things like that. Dementias generally are progressive, okay? Which means they get worse. Uh, they don't go up and down for the most part. Um, you're not gonna have dementia one day and then be fine the next day unless there's something going on that we could, that's reversible, right? Unless there's something medically going on. For the most part, even though things are progressive, these dementias are going to affect new things more. So it's very rare that long-term long -term memory or memories from childhood or memory for things that you know how to do really, really well and things in your routine, those things tend to stick around. Uh, so while, while functioning gets worse, it's really what we're observing is the inability to learn new things and to learn new information. But for the most part, even though things tend to get worse, uh, the things that are, have been around for a long time and are really solidified tend to stay there. They tend to, tend to stay intact. When we make a diagnosis of dementia or we start getting worried, we're, we're looking across multiple domains. So we're looking and seeing how are you doing cognitively? So memory and language and problem solving. And then how are you doing behaviorally or emotionally? So in, in all of these syndromes, there's, there's that affective or emotional piece where there's, there could be increased moodiness, there can be that lack of motivation and apathy, there can be increased irritability, agitation. And those things obviously will overlap with standalone depression or standalone anxiety, and they can start to muddy the picture a little bit. And then there's the functional decline, right? So like I said, finances and medication, managing your own medications and remembering to take them and driving and cooking and doing all those things. So it's really when these cognitive and, and behavioral difficulties start to interfere with the functional stuff. That's when we say we might have, a, might have somebody who needs a diagnosis of dementia. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common one. It's the one that's talked about the most on the news. It's the one that is um, most well known. It's the most common cause of dementia. Um, the most typical presentation is the eighth decade of life or sometime in your 70s. Um, we will see first, have first contact with folks uh, from their mid 60s all the way up to their mid 70s. But for the most part, it's that late 60s, early 70s group um, that is the most common time when uh, difficulties will become aware to family members or to other doctors or to the patient themselves, and that's when they'll present the most. There is a genetic link in some cases. It's not always genetic. Um, it's not something that is uh, hereditary in a term that if somebody in your family has it, you're definitely going to get it, but it is genetic in some cases so that if it's in the family, you might have an increased risk. Right, doesn't mean you're gonna get it, but it could mean you have a higher, a higher chance. The key thing with Alzheimer's disease is that it's very slow. The, the typical form of Alzheimer's disease is a very slow, progressive type of thing. Nothing is sudden. There's, no, there's very few day-to-day -day changes. Um, it evolves over time. It's a slow, eroding type of process. Classically, it's defined by memory deficits, so that's the most common Common reason people show up is they say, I can't remember things. But there's, there's also very um, 
pronounced language deficits and visuospatial deficits. So that means that visuospatial functioning is how is your, how is your brain really making sense of what you're seeing? Um, how's your depth perception? How's your ability to judge how close things are to each other? Um, and when you have a neuropsychological evaluation, these are some of the domains that we look at, right? So we look at your memory functioning and your language functioning. The other thing to think about with memory um, is the term memory is, is overused, or to say I forgot something is, is probably overused. Um, very few people actually forget something in a, um, in a, in a way that they've, they've held on to information and then that information has gone away, right? So to remember something, you have to pay attention to it, you have to hear it, you have to upload it and get it into your system, and then later on you have to go get it. You have to retrieve it or you have to be able to recognize it. And that's just sort of a, a general overview of, the, of a memory system. Your, your ability to come up with a piece of information a half hour after you learned it or a half hour after you were exposed to it is dependent on all of those things working together. So to forget something means that that whole system works great and then right in the end it just goes away. That, that's technically forgetting. For the most part, people have trouble learning things and they have trouble uploading information and sort of getting it into their brain and having it stick and then they have trouble retrieving it. Right? So that's, those, are, those are the most common reasons why somebody forgets something. So when we look at Alzheimer's disease, the presentation uh, requires you to look at all those different stages of memory and to really get a sense for where in the process did it break down. And that can give us um, a good idea of why somebody's struggling on a daily basis and then how to help them as well. Vascular disease, very, very common. Overlooked, not talked about as much, not talked about as much as it should be talked about. Something that shows up in my office 20 times more than Alzheimer's disease does. Vascular disease is how healthy is your brain, essentially. How well does your brain get blood? And then how well does your brain get oxygen? And how well does your brain get all the good minerals and stuff that it needs to be healthy? So your vascular system is what brings your blood everywhere in your body. And if you have some of these risk factors, right, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, kidney disease, if you're a smoker, a long-term smoker, these are all cerebrovascular risk factors. So they affect the health of your heart and they affect the, uh, the health of your brain. If you've got a history of these things, not everybody, but for the most part, if you've got, especially if you have a history of these things that are untreated, they have impacted the health of your brain. That doesn't mean that they've impacted the health of your brain to the point where you're going to get vascular dementia, but it's something to think about. Um, this is something that happens to a lot of people and they just assume they have Alzheimer's disease, they actually have vascular disease. Um, and it's a much different presentation, it's a much different course, it affects people in a much different way. This is something that you can, when we talk about um, later on, we'll talk about how to keep your brain healthy. These are some of the things you have control over, okay? <clears throat> and not all cognitive complaints are because you have dementia, right? Or because you have Alzheimer's disease or because you have vascular disease. There are a lot of reasons why you can have cognitive difficulties. The majority of people don't have an illness that is affecting the health of their brain. They have one of these other types of things. And that's, it's important to rule these things out, right? Because your treatment's gonna be different, your prognosis is gonna be different. Depression and anxiety is a huge cause of memory complaints, right? If, you have, if you're depressed or it's untreated or you're anxious and it's untreated, your memory's not gonna be as good, your concentration's not gonna be as good, your processing speed is gonna be slow. You have, I like to tell people you have one brain and your brain has to do all of your memory and has to do all of your organization and it also has to do all of your worry and all of your stress, all of your anxiety, all of your mood. Sometimes it's even the same system. So the systems in your brain that are responsible for memory are the same that might be responsible for emotion in some cases. So if you're overloaded emotionally and you've got a lot going on and you're stressed out and you're distracted, you're not going to remember things as well. Right? And it's going to look the exact same on a daily basis. 
you show up at the store and you can't remember what to buy, that doesn't tell you anything. It just means you forgot what to buy. It doesn't tell you if it's because there's some sort of illness affecting the health of your brain or if because you're distracted because you got an argument in the morning or if you didn't sleep well, right? So there's a lot of different things there. Different medications, right? We'll talk about this a little later too. Different medications have different types of side effects. It can affect people differently as they get older. That can be a reason. Alcohol, narcotics, physical illnesses like thyroid disease, low B12 levels. So the, the point is don't, don't jump to conclusions, right? If you forget something or you notice somebody is forgetting things or you notice somebody is having trouble on a daily basis, there's a lot of potentially, a lot of different reasons. There are some things we have control over and some things we don't have control over though, right? So things we can't change is you're going to get older. Everybody's going to get older. If you have a family history, right? So if you're genetically predisposed to some sort of disease, right, specific gene mutations. Females have a higher rate of developing dementia than males. Education, something that we'll talk about a little bit. And then if you've had repeated head injury. So the, the head injury thing is controversial nowadays. I wouldn't pay too much attention to that unless you're somebody that got whacked in the head every single day for 30 years. Um, so, things you can change. How healthy are you, right? Do you have diabetes? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have high cholesterol? Do you have sleep apnea? These are all things that are treatable, right? And if you start lowering your blood pressure, you will start lowering the impact that that high blood pressure has on the health of your brain. If you're drinking too much, if you're smoking, um, I don't want to scare anybody too much. Smoking is one of the, right? We talk about smoking is bad for your heart and bad for your lungs, so it's just as bad for your brain. Um, it reduces the amount of oxygen you can take into your bloodstream, and then it reduces the amount of oxygen that then gets dispersed to the rest of your body. So the, um, the, let's say the end of, if you're a smoker, the end of the line doesn't get as much oxygen. So the tips of your fingers, the tips of your toes, and the middle of your brain. It's the end of the line, essentially, from your heart. So those are going to get the least amount of oxygen. So you're going to start to see deterioration. And how much are you exercising, right? How much are you keeping yourself healthy? And how well are you eating? Those are things we have control over. And, um, you know, we, we can't prevent a lot of these things, right? If, you, if, you're, if, you're going to, if something's going to happen to you, and genetically it's going to happen to you, but we're, you can affect when does it happen and how fast does it happen in a lot of places. So that's, that's the concept of cognitive reserve. And it's important because you can affect your cognitive reserve in some cases. Cognitive reserve essentially is how much money in the bank do you have? How much cognitive money in the bank? So how educated are you? How active are you? How healthy are you? All will give you this a pool of cognitive reserve. Think of it as like a shield or a, a, a protective factors, OK? Everybody is different. Everybody starts at a different place. But we know why this is important because when you look at people that have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or some sort of dementia, the amount of deterioration that you see in the brain after somebody passes away isn't directly linked to how bad they were or how good they were doing when they were alive. Okay? So you can take somebody that had very little, very little difficulties in daily life until they passed away. And then you can take a, take a look at their brain and you can say, wow, this was, person was riddled with Alzheimer's disease, right? And their brain was very, very unhealthy, but they, sh they didn't show a commensurate level of decline when they were alive. Then on the other hand, you can have somebody that is really having a rough time functioning and has a lot of difficulties with IADLs and even starts to have some ADL di difficulties. And then you can look at their brain and you can say, it doesn't look that bad, right? So things affect people differently. And it really depends on where you start. I'm going to walk over here. So, so if we consider this, how much cognitive reserve do you have? So if you start here or you start here, even on the same rate of decline, where you get to this green line, which is, say, this is when we start to notice problems. You might get here at 60 
or you might get here 60 or 80, right? Depending on where you start. So the healthier you are, the more active you are, the more reading you do, the more you take care of yourself, you can bump your cognitive reserve up a little bit, right? And that's gonna, you're gonna be able to spend more money before you bounce a check, right? Before you start, before we start to notice that you're having some difficulties. Those are the things we can have some control over. Now, it's, very, that's, it's easy to say that, and it's, you know, it's, it's nice in theory, but this really works, right? This is really when we talk about treatment and like the best things you can do to keep yourself in good shape or the best things you can do to keep yourself independent or not needing help and not needing assistance is really staying healthy, right? And staying active and taking care of yourself in a way that you've got, you have more money that you have to burn through before you start having difficulties. And if we think about that last slide, maybe I'll actually go back to it. So if we think about this last slide, if we get an assessment right at the beginning is of, of the decline, right? If we, if we identify something at the top of that blue line, we can put things in place, right? If we wait until right below the, right at the green line, right when we start to notice a lot of, a lot of difficult problems, or when it becomes very, very obvious, things can get a little bit harder to, it can be harder to treat and it can be harder to, to, to make an impact on what's going on. So when we don't do things early and we don't get, get a hold of things or we don't do assessments early in the process, you're going to burn through more of that cognitive reserve, right? You're going to have less to work with by the time you get in front of somebody so we can put some things in place. So when we talk about early assessment and we talk about really trying to get in on the ground floor or, or get somebody in front of a doctor as soon as we notice problems, we really want to rule out some things, right? We want to rule out all those other medical things and rule out some of those reversible causes that we talked about. And we want to be able to tell you if nothing's wrong and you don't need to worry about anything. Or we want to identify really something that's going on so we can talk about treatment. We want to educate people on exactly what's going on so that you can understand exactly how things are going to look. We want to offer some support. Right? If there's family involved or there's caregivers involved or just for the, the patient themselves. We want to make plans. Right? So depending on where we catch you and depending on what's going on, there could be a long time coming before we need extra help or there could be a, a, a short amount of time before we need extra help. And then we want to start addressing all those IADLs. Financial management, medication management, medical decisions, driving, living independently, all those things that we do on a daily basis that we might start having difficulties with. We want to get to those things early because we want to be proactive. We don't want to be reactive, right? So we want to say, hey, this is at, we're at risk for this type of difficulty. Let's not wait until there's a crisis, right? Let's not wait until there's a car accident or wait until there's a hospitalization. Let's do something so we can get in on making these things uh, a little bit easier to deal with before they get to a, a point where there's a, there's a big medical crisis and you're, you're making decisions from a hospital room. And there's a lot of resources for these types of things too, right? I mean, we, this is a small town, but we actually have quite a few resources here um, for these types of things. And um, they're not overly well known, but if, if, you, if you start to have these types of concerns, there, there's ways to connect with the community and community-based resources. So the other thing is we want all the medical treatment that we can get, right? And we want to we be able to address things uh, as soon as possible. So there's different medications, and we're, there's a slide for medications later, but we want to start medications as soon as possible. We want to address all those medical things that can contribute to memory decline. We want to address depression or anxiety or vitamin, you know, uh, thyroid levels or B12 levels. And um, we have to start talking about, if there is something going on, we want to start talking about where is it going, how fast is it going to go there, and what do we, start, what do we need to do to start planning. 
So the ideal process of addressing all of these things, and this is the hardest part, is actually telling a provider what's going on, right? Um, this can be the most difficult thing for somebody to come in and tell you that there's something wrong because number one, they're not, it's hard for, if somebody is having memory problems, sometimes they're not the best reporter of memory problems. Um, and sometimes there's family members telling them there's something wrong, which nobody likes to hear, right? And can be very, very difficult and create a lot of tension. Rule out those treatable causes and neuroimaging. We're gonna talk about those things. And then we want a referral to a specialist. So these five things. The things you're gonna do, you're gonna see a primary care physician and we're gonna do a lot of, we're gonna talk about all these things individually, okay. So the first step is normally a primary care physician, right, it's your family doctor. You go in and you say, I think I'm having some memory problems or somebody goes in with somebody and says, I think they're having some memory problems. There's a standard protocol for your primary care physician at that point. Okay, there's standard blood tests, there's standard things that they're going to look at that are those first line of reversible causes, okay? Those things should happen right away as soon as you get to a certain age and you, and you go in and talk about cognitive difficulties. There's a lot of things, right? We talked about the, a little bit of these things. So there's, and then urinary tract infection. Um, so there's a lot of things that, are, that the first line, your primary care provider is going to do, right? That is, there's going to say, okay, if it's not any of these things, then we'll take the next step. <clears throat> that next step after that is usually sitting down and interviewing, right? The primary care physician comes back in and says, okay, all those things were negative. What really is going on here, okay? That almost always will involve a family member or a caretaker. After that, you're probably gonna get referred to a specialist, like a neuropsychologist. Um, and I probably skimmed over that, I don't think so. Does anybody know what a neuropsychologist does? Anybody? Good, okay, so let me spend a minute. I probably should have done that in the beginning. So, um, I'm a clinical psychologist, I'm not a physician, so I'm a PhD, not an MD. But I did extra stuff in that training and extra training in uh, medical stuff and neuro, neuroanatomy and neurological functioning to become a neuropsychologist. So my job is to assess how's your brain doing, okay? And is to integrate all of the things that can affect how somebody's brain works. Not what it looks like on an image, and, um, but really how, does, how is it working? So all those psychological things that can affect how your brain works and all of the medical things that can affect how your brain works. The, the standard of care for a, a diagnosis of dementia runs through the neuropsychologist because we don't just take a picture of how your brain looks because how it looks might not necessarily mean how it's actually working, okay? So the referral to the specialist will then happen <clears throat> along with some neuroimaging. So the reason why we do neuroimaging, and most of the time for these types of concerns, it's a quick CT scan. It's not a really long MRI with your stuffed into a tube and really noisy, but for the most part, it's a quick CT scan the next thing you're looking for is, is something that is reversible again, right? So you're looking for, there, is there a big stroke? Is there a tumor? Is there something going on that's visible on a CT scan? Then you're gonna have this neuropsych evaluation. So the neuropsychological evaluation will ask you to remember words, solve problems, um, see how well you can plan and uh, address common social situations. It's pen and paper type stuff usually takes an hour and a half or two hours. Um, and different parts of the brain do different things. So when you come in for a neuropsych eval, you're, we're gonna ask you to do all those, basically all those different things that your brain can do. And then that gives us really good information about what parts of your brain are working well, and what parts of your brain might not be working as well as they should be working for how old you are, how much education you have, and your medical history. Right, so it's all relative. It's all relative to, you know, as much as possible. We don't compare you to 20-year-olds or 30-year-olds type of a thing when we do these types of evaluations. That wouldn't be fair. We want to see how is somebody doing for a 65-year-old male with 14 years of education. That's what we'll compare you to. This allows us to tell you exactly what's going on and it allows us to get a, a profile of strengths and weaknesses and it can tell us what are we going to do about it, right? How do we make decisions going forward about treatment 
and about how to stay safe and how to stay independent and how to stay functioning as, as, at a high level as possible. So this process really works the best when everybody's working together. The, the specialty providers in this case, aside from neuropsychology, can be a neurologist, uh, can be a psychiatrist, um, but for the most part, it'll probably be a neurologist. Um, but when everybody's working together, this is when you get the most accurate diagnosis, you get the best treatment plan, you get the best outcomes, you have the most access to different types of medications, and um, this is when things work well, right? When the primary care starts the referral process, and you get in front of specialists, and you go through this process. Okay. I have a little bit of water. This is, these are the things most people want to know about. So <clears throat> we talk about Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease and dementia and all these things that can happen. And the most common question is, okay, then what, how can I stop these things? So for the most part, we're talking about prevention or we're talking about slowing things down, okay? With something like Alzheimer's disease that is genetic, if you have it, you have it. Okay, you can slow it down a little bit, um, but something like vascular disease is really preventable, right? It's preventable in your 30s, 40s, and 50s, right? So sometimes it's hard to pull up the tracks once if, if things have really set in and you've got a lot of damage. But for the most part, we want to talk about prevention. So we want to reduce all these cerebrovascular risk factors, right? We want to be active physically. We want to eat well. No smoking. Moderate alcohol consumption you know, low cholesterol, managed diabetes. These are all the physical systemic things that your primary care treats, right? And that your primary care is monitoring you for. Sleep apnea is actually another big risk factor for cognitive impairment. And it's something that maybe not everybody will ask you, actually ask you about, right? Um, but sleep apnea reduces oxygen levels in the blood. And then if you've had sleep apnea for 30 years and you haven't had it treated, well, your brain's not going to be as healthy as it could have been if you had been getting oxygenated properly that whole time. Something like that is very treatable and is something that you can stop the damage. Right? Once you get that treated, there's no more damage after you get it treated if you get it treated properly. Mood is a big one. Okay? The classic presentation that we talk about in neuropsychology or the classic question is dementia or depression, right? They look exactly the same, okay? There's cognitive impairment, there's functional impairment, and there's affective and emotional impairment, right? They will look the same on a daily basis to the untrained eye, right? You just will have trouble remembering things, you'll have low energy, you'll be irritable, you'll have low motivation, and you won't be able to remember anything. But they're for very different reasons, right? So we need to address these things. Learning new things, reading, doing something that's hard cognitively every day. So the picture here is one brain cell that doesn't have a lot and then one brain cell that's got a lot of connections, okay? So we actually can, you know, you actually can affect how healthy your brain is by increasing your activity. So some, you know, reading every day, doing something hard every single day that's cognitively demanding is actually very important and it actually works. Um, the common question here is should I pay for, pay for those online games or should I pay for those programs? Do those things really work? Um, yeah, they work, but you can do that stuff other ways, right? You can make sure that you're having conversations with your family and you can play cards and you can read books and you can do things that are demanding um, without specifically playing a computer game. Those things are great if you like that stuff, uh, but the, the message here is just do something with your brain, do something that's hard to do, um, and you will benefit from it. Don't drink too much alcohol. Uh, you don't have to avoid completely, um, but it has to be in moderation. Keep in mind prescriptions, right, that can have an adverse effect. Uh, if you're concerned that there's too much alcohol, uh, you should talk to your, your, your physician about it, talk to your doctor about it, and ask. Um, for the most part, a little, you know, one drink a day is not a big deal. 
and sometimes some points it's healthy, right? So we know that the, the, the peak health is people that have a, a moderate amount of alcohol and normally tend to be healthier than people that have none or people that drink too much. Exercise. Exercise doesn't have to mean you're in the gym every single day, right? Don't avoid activity if you can't do as much as you want to do because you're busy or physically you're limited in some way. Anything you can do is good, okay? Any walking you can do every day, any swimming you can do, any activity at the gym, anything is good, okay? It's vitally important. Exercise is medicine, okay? You should really think of exercise as medicine. It's preventative. It, it, it has a multitude of good effects on your body. Um, you will reduce your cerebrovascular risk factors, your hypertension, your diabetes, those types of things, if you're active and if you're exercising. People that exercise and eat well have less cognitive impairment as they get older. Okay? Protect your head. Now, this doesn't mean, you know, if you bump your head on the table when you bend over to pick something up, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. Um, this means that um, as you get older, if you fall, you're at a higher risk for, for brain bleeds. Um, and you're at a higher risk, therefore, for hospitalizations. And we want to avoid hospitalizations. Hospitaliza people get sick sometimes when they go into the hospital, especially as you get older. So how, really, this is a don't fall type of a slide. Okay, and how do, you, how do we avoid falls? We make sure the house is safe, right? We pick up fall hazards. We have grab bars going in and out of showers. We, we're, we do things preventatively. You don't wait until you fall to make a change, right? Preferably you make changes to make sure you never fall. So uh, anticholinergic medications. This is something that most doctors should be talking to you about as you get older. This doesn't mean that, all of these that any of these medications are, are off limits. This just means that if you're on two or three of these, that could be affecting things in some way. Now, some of these medications are great, and some of you might be on some of them, and that's fine if you're tolerating it. But there's, there are a list of medications that, can have, that are more likely to give you cognitive side effects or make you a little fuzzy make you a little slow, slow things down a little bit more. Um, these are all medications that dull the production of certain neurotransmitters that are helpful for memory and helpful for cognition. If you have questions about these things, you should ask your, your primary care physician. Um, and you want to avoid multiples of these types of medications. This is a big one. What I like to tell people is you can't forget or remember something you don't hear, okay? So it sounds glib and it sounds funny, but honestly, not hearing something and then saying later you forgot it is not forgetting, right? So optimizing hearing, optimizing vision, those things can have a big impact on functioning. So if we're talking about balancing a checkbook and driving, as the two big reasons that somebody in your life is getting concerned about somebody, well, those two things might be related to vision, right? Um, if we're talking about purely about memory and, you know, because every time you yell across the hallway and you tell somebody something, they forget it 10 minutes later, how do we know they heard you, right? So the, the first things that we do when somebody comes in is we check these things, right? Like, how's your vision? How's your eyesight? How's your hearing? Do we, can we address any of those things? Like, let's, let's rule that out before we jump to bad stuff, right? Before we, we, before we jump ahead. And then if you're, the other, you know, the last thing you can do is get, is you can have an evaluation, right? Um, the, the earlier you know something's going on or the earlier you know something isn't going on, the better shape you're going to be in. Right? The more options you're going to have, the more things are going to be available to you. So one of the questions I always get, so I just added the slide, is these memory medications and do they work? Uh, these are the most common ones. Uh, Aricept and Nemenda are the two most common ones. Um, so here's how we think of these things. Um, 
if something's going on and we diagnose a neurodegenerative process or a disease that's, that is going to get worse, um, these, these medications don't plug the hole in the boat, right? So if your boat is sinking and there's a hole in your boat, those medications will help you bail the water out, but they're not going to plug the hole, okay? They don't stop the disease process, but they can slow it down a little bit. Uh, they increase different neurotransmitter activities in the brain, theoretically. Um, they're most helpful. The, the earlier you get them, the more helpful they will be, okay? So there's not a lot of good evidence that says these medications will help somebody in, a, in the moderate to severe stage of a disease. Some of them are intended for more moderate stage, but honestly, when you look at the research as a whole, it's very clear that the earlier you can get these on board, the more good they will do. And essentially what happens is, back to this slide, is they're just going to sort of slow your rate down a little bit, right? They're going to bail the water out of the boat and you're going to float longer, okay? Which is actually can be a big deal, right? That, that floating longer can represent independent living. It can represent not needing you know, a caregiver. It can represent driving longer on your own. So those medications, they can be helpful, but they have to be, they have to be done right and they have to be done on time. Um, but it, it's definitely, definitely something that's worth a shot. Okay. So one of the things I talk to people a lot about is, I, I've mentioned it before, is being proactive and being, being preventative being proactive, not reactive. If you wait too long and you're reacting to a crisis or you are finding out that you're having, the, you find out that somebody has trouble managing a checkbook when, you, when, there, when there's a crisis, right? Or you find out that somebody's having trouble driving after an accident and somebody gets hurt. That is not the time you want to make changes, okay? You want to be preventative. Um, Prevent, these are all preventable things. So a UTI is a urinary tract infection. It's one of the most common reasons people get up, actually end up in the hospital as they get older. Most of the time it's related to dehydration, which is a very simple thing to fix, right? It's a very easy, preventable thing. Car accidents are preventable in most cases, right? We can tell you if you're at risk. Right? And when I talked about driving to people, driving is a very sensitive subject. Driving isn't about knowing how to find your way home. Driving is about reacting to a 20-year-old going 90 miles an hour down the street, right? So it doesn't matter whose fault it is. It just matters if something happens. Um, medic, poor medication adherence, not, not remembering to take medications is a big risk factor. Uh, taking too much, getting confused, forgetting if you took it or you didn't take it is a big risk factor. Uh, and those things can lead to falls and injuries, right? And falls and injuries can lead to hospitalizations. And dehydration can lead to hospitalizations. And that becomes a crisis at that point. And that often becomes uh, when families are making decisions about living arrangements and levels of care, and you've got a two-day hospitalization to make all these adjustments and changes. And they can be very stressful. So um, the, big thing I like to, the big thing to take home is, is be, be proactive. Uh, don't wait. Get something looked at if, if there are concerns, and you can avoid a whole lot of stress later on. So, okay. So I rushed through that. Hope we got through everything. But questions? Let me know. Yeah. You have not mentioned or you, you talk about medication only to prevent the, or reduce the delay, delay the dementia by medication. What are the natural way? The food intake. Yep. So eating healthy, exercise. Yeah, eating healthy, I mean, I, I, I mean, you talk about diet, general you talk about. Is there a special food that you should eat that delay damage? Foods that you can eat that delay damage. For, for example. Okay. So um, there's, there's evidence for things like the Mediterranean diet, right? High in good fats, high in um, avocados, olive oil, fishes, things like that. Um, there's the blueberry hypothesis, the antioxidant hypothesis, things like that. Um, for the most part, though, eating a balanced diet, right? Low, you know, things that uh, aren't high in sugar, low carbohydrates, things that don't give you high blood pressure, things that don't give you diabetes, things like that are good. You want, you want more specifics? For example, if you had a carrot, you your eye, for example. Okay. 
as if a walnut. It looks like a brain shell. There's, the shape of a brain maybe help you brain. I don't know. I'll, I'll give you an example. I, there's not a lot of specific examples that have a lot of evidence behind them. Um, so I don't, I mean, you know, lean meats, fish, um, olive oil instead of oils high in transaturated fat, things like that. Yeah, nuts are good. Uh, I can tell you what to stay away from. There's, there's more evidence of what not to eat than there is evidence of what to eat. Yeah, things like that. Is that better? Is that more specific? I, it's, it's hard. It's a, it's a good question. It's hard. It's hard to say eat this and you won't get Alzheimer's disease. There's no evidence that says that specifically. The healthiest guy on your slide was the fellow sailing out the water. He's getting all the exercise. Right. <laughs> I don't know where I read it. It could be a Mayo Clinic newsletter or ARB or something. But they said a lot about clutter. And it's really important to decrease your clutter when you have a dementia. Like around the house? Yes. Yeah. So clutter is a trip hazard. It's a fall hazard, right? Um, and it makes things hard to organize. It makes things hard to locate. Um, it's easier to lose things. Yeah. yeah. That's not going to stop anything, but it can improve optimized functioning. And decreases stress. Right. Yes, can you tell us how level of education uh, impacts brain performance later in life? So the, the research would say that the higher levels of education that you have, so the more schooling that you've done, would mean the more reading that you've done and the, uh, the more protective factors. It's not the only thing. It's just part of the puzzle. So that, that's not to say that if you don't have 20 years of education, you can't have high levels of cognitive reserve. Um, it just, people, it, it tends to hang together. High levels of education, healthy lifestyle, um, and lower rates of decline into dementia tend to hang together. An example, I know people with college degrees who don't read. Yep, you're exactly right, right? So that's not, that's not a defining feature. It's, um, it's part of the puzzle. It's part of the, part of the equation. I've seen a medical doctor with a dementia. Oh, totally. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, it's... it's it's just part of the it's just part of the equation, yeah. And it's really to say that as you get older, the more you can read and the more cognitively active you are, the the better off you can be. So should I answer? Should I call people or do you want to? Oh, okay, go ahead. I actually have two questions. The first one, the medication that you had up there for like five seconds. Um, what are their side effects? Are there side effects? Mm -hmm. So um, there can be gastrointestinal upset, uh, nausea, diarrhea. Uh, there can be some incontinence in some cases, dry mouth. Um, for the, you know, it, it's, those are the most common ones. Um, there's certainly a wide side effect profile. Um, the most common ones that I see, the ones that the patients that get to me that are on them that are having side effects would be incontinence uh, and gastrointestinal stomach upset. Okay, my second question is, you mentioned that I think you're a neuropsychiatrist? So, neuropsychologist. Neuro okay. Yep. Oh. And if we have a loved one that is already seeing a neurologist, mm -hmm. Do we need to also see them, the psychiatrists? Or do we stick with just the neurologist? It, everybody does things differently, and it's up to you guys. Um, if you're happy with the diagnosis, and you're happy with the care, and you're happy with the education, and there's nothing to add, then no, right? Save yourself the appointment. Save yourself the stress. Um, if you feel like something is lacking with regards to clarity or recommendations or questions that you haven't had answered and you feel like they're not getting answered, then yeah, you, you certainly could. Um, some people don't need to see a neuropsychologist. 
Some people never get to a neuropsychologist. Some people never get to the neurologist, right? And their questions are answered and their, their case is handled along the way by a different team. Um, but it's really individualized um, and it, it's, it's hard to tell generally. Okay, I actually have a third question sure. if I could ask them. Do you have any advice on how to deal with a parent that is, is not, the, the parent who is the caregiver with denial on their part of their loved one yep. showing signs of dementia? Yeah, it's it, that's that the hard the hardest part of my job is taking care of caregivers, um, and um, and really getting across to caregivers that they need to take care of themselves, um, and and putting them in a position where they can be taken care of, um, and then grieving. No, that's, that's well. So so in your case, you're saying there's there's a a, a couple the, and one the, person has a something yeah, wrong mom and then has right. So, so, so the next, the next step there is what I'm saying is not only taking care of dad, but also giving him a place to process what's going on and grieve a little bit. Um, that's hard to do sometimes within a family and different family dynamics and uh, different roles that people have. And then, um, so what I like to do is, in a, in a case like that, is we, we have a conversation with that spouse um, about what's going on and how we can support them and how we can give them a place to talk about the loss that's happening. It, it's, it's not an easy thing to see sometimes. Um, there's no specific advice other than to be supportive, be empathic, and understand that um, it's really hard to go through as a caregiver and as a spouse, as just as hard or harder than the patient in most cases. Sorry, they can't see you, so. <laughs> um, I think probably a lot of us are here because we have parents or something who are dementia, so we're kind of. I said, I, I assume a lot of us are probably here because we fear for our own well being because we have parents or something who have suffered from or are suffering from, from dementia. Is there a screening process for people? I'm in my mid 60s. So mm -hmm. If you're not, um, you know, it, it would depend on what, what the disease is that's in the family, um, and it would depend on your age and, you know, the health factors and other things. There, there are screenings. There are primary care screenings. There are screenings you can do in the doctor's office. Um, they're... Ability to detect or to you know say yes you have it or say no you don't and be correct is, is kind of good. It's not perfect. Um, um, they're but they're not going to pick up on something in a high functioning person with no clear signs, right? Um, so yeah, I have people sometimes that show up and say there's nothing wrong with me, but it's in my family and I want a baseline um, and I want you to give me the hardest test you have. And I want to see if there's anything going on. And I say, okay, you know, it's up to you. Um, my, you know, that that's good for business. But on the other hand, I would tell you not to worry, um, unless unless there's something going on that is really getting in the way of functioning, that somebody else is noticing, and that it's not it's not just I lost my keys for five minutes. Yeah. One other quick question: Is there a point at which if someone's taking air and then then the at which it um, if it's not tolerated, so if they are having significant side effects, sometimes it's it's or not. I mean, if you can tolerate it, it's not going to hurt, and it's only going to help, theoretically. <laughs> so no, normally, you don't have to you don't come off of it unless there's an ill effect, unless there's a side effect. Yeah. Quick question on driving, which you alluded to. Mm -hmm. Do you have any? parameters and when you would suggest that a, a client stops driving, yeah. or how do you approach that a little bit more specifically? Um, so 
the cognitive testing that we do that looks at decision making and reaction time and processing speed certainly plays a big part in that. Um, and if you have trouble navigating some, some things on an 8 by 11 piece of paper, you know, you're going to have trouble driving. Uh, and there's good, there's, good court, there's good research with good relationships between driving safety and the testing we do. Um, so we look at that. We look at what the family is saying. Uh, look at how people park in the parking lot when they pull in. Um, I have a low threshold for driving, um, or, or, or at least recommending that somebody shouldn't drive. So I, no, no physician, unless you've had a seizure or some sort of big neurological event, you can't pull your license. Um, how I go about that when I have significant driving concerns is through a combination of being nice and understanding and then trying to scare somebody a little bit. Um, I mean, I've been involved in cases where there's been an accident and somebody has been hurt and then I will get a stack of records that, of a patient I've never seen and the lawyer will say, should this person have been driving, right? And you go through the records and you go through the testing and you say no, right? Um, so. What I do if somebody's not cooperative with that is I say, I've documented this. If you get in an accident, you're going to have to defend why you went against medical advice. Um, and I say, here's a script to go over to the Secretary of State and get an on the road test. Um, and then if you pass, you pass, right? It doesn't matter what I say. If you go to Secretary of State and pass, you pass. If you go there and fail, they cut your license and it's over. You can't argue with them. So I try to get people to go get that test, for the most part. A couple of quick questions. What's a unit of alcohol? For a, at what age? Well, you had under 65 and over 65. So under 65 is usually uh, 1.5 ounces of an 80 proof spirit, 12 ounces of a 5% beer, and 6 ounces of a standard wine. Okay? Uh, over 65 to 70, you can cut that in half, okay. for the most part. So that's 10, so under 65, it's 6 to 10 standard units per week for an otherwise healthy female, right, without hypertension, diabetes, and, and 10 to 14 units per week for an otherwise health, healthy male, and then cut that in half as you get older. I have heard something about um, gastrointestinal medications like angioprozole, things like that, potentially being uh, linked with dementia. Do you know anything about that? Um, I've heard that too. Um, I haven't seen that clinically. Um, there are certainly uh, rare combinations of medications that can that interact with those things. For the most part, they would not look like a slow progressive dementia, though. It would look like what's wrong today? Like why is why is this all of a sudden happening? Like a side effect. It, it would look like a sudden onset, for the most part. Um, and it's usually something that we, you would catch, like a primary care would catch or a neurologist would catch. Um, so it's rare. I know, I mean, I've, I've seen that, that those, those articles and uh, there's not a lot of overwhelming evidence that it happens, but it's, it's a rare sort of side effect. Okay, my last quick question, what about sleep aids? In terms of, like, are they good news or bad news? They're dangerous, they're over the counter type things. Yeah, so, yeah, they can be dangerous, right? So if you're cognitively vulnerable, if you've got a lot of cerebrovascular disease and you don't have a healthy brain, it might take you a little bit longer to shake off the NyQuil than if you had a healthy brain. Um, they don't cause a progressive neurodegenerative illness, but they can be a cause for acute cognitive failure. Yeah, I mean, you shouldn't, I mean, if you're concerned about something like that, like that's a question for your primary care physician. Um, but if you're not sleeping, you can have cognitive impairment too. So sleep is something that always needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, well, I, like I said before, if you don't hear something, you can't remember it. So in that case, yes, because you will hear less and you won't remember things. But is there, there's not a direct, you know, hearing loss does not cause a disease that will affect the health of the brain. Are there any 
So no, no. But you can't remember something if you don't hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One more questions? Thank you.